Hi everyone, welcome back to AI News. Today we have our old friend, uh, Mike Cargyle, with us again. Um, and he is running again to fight for this district. Uh, Mr. Cargyle, uh, remind our audience who you are and uh, which district and which city you represent. Uh, I am Mike Cargyle, and I'm running for the United States House of Representatives. And it is the 35th district, and it spans from... Pomona, California, all the way to Fontana, and all the way down to Eastvale. The center of the district is the Ontario International Airport. It has nine cities, Pomona, Upland, Montclair, uh, Rancho, uh, Fontana, uh, Ontario, Chino, Chino Hills, Eastvale. Um, so it's, it's quite a district. And I think it's the best district in California. <laughs> but this is a federal level office. So I'm running to represent the United States. And we will deal with everything from energy and in independence to uh, the Second Amendment <laughs> and its impact on U.S. citizens. So even if you don't live in the district and you can't vote for me directly, we do need your help and your support because everything we do at this level will impact you wherever you are. I know you from two years ago, our first interview, and we we did great. You're a faithful guy. And then uh, the things you said really encourage a lot of Christian at our time. What makes you want to run this time? Well, we need me. I mean, more than ever, we need President Trump back in office. And we need people who will faithfully support the Trump agenda in office. But Right now, what we're dealing with as a country and the world at, at large is a fight of good and evil. It's a biblical fight. And right now, the reason it looks so dark is because the church has lost its way. Mm -hmm. And when I say the church, I'm talking mainly about pastors. Okay. So in the Bible, pastors are called shepherds, mm -hmm. right? And so the shepherd has a flock, and that would be your local church or congregation. So this shepherd has a job. It's to safeguard this flock. And if he sees danger come, he's going to either move the flock out of the way or he's going to stand between the flock and that danger. And he's going to take on. We saw this with David, you know, who was the good shepherd himself. And he would fight the lions and the, the you know, the, the bears on behalf of his father's sheep. And that's what a good shepherd does. But today, sadly, in the church, we have so many shepherds that are not good shepherds. They're either hirelings, which means they don't feel that the flock doesn't belong to them. So they're not responsible for the flock. Or they're just like another sheep. They're following the sheep and the sheep are leading the way. Or they're wolves in sheep's clothing. And that's the most dangerous because they're there to destroy the flock. And so what we have right now are, and I say this over and over, if the flock, which you could say is the country right now, if the country is out of control and there's chaos, I don't blame sheep for being sheep. That's mm. what they do. I always look at the shepherd and I say, why is your flock out of control? You're the shepherd. What are you doing wrong? What are we doing that's not allowing that flock to flourish. And what we have right now are a bunch of shepherds who are busy counting sheep. They want to know how many sheep they have in their flock, and they think they're being successful if the numbers go up. Yeah. But I'm here to tell the shepherds, listen, your job is not to count sheep. Sheep beget sheep. Shepherds don't beget sheep. Mm -hmm. Right? So when your flock is healthy, meaning you're feeding them the Word of God, and they're being uh, nourished, and they're being safe and protected, and the water's flowing, that's, that flock will prosper, and your numbers will go up as a due course because sheep beget sheep. But if you're counting the sheep, you're not looking in the valley, and we travel down the valley of the shadow of death, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So my job as a legislator is to look at the valley. I'm not a shepherd. That's their job. But my job is to look down the valley and make sure the grass is growing, the water is flowing, and if there's a wolf on the horizon, I'm going to give the shepherd a heads up, and I'll try and take him out myself if possible. 
but I'm here to nourish the valley so that the shepherds and their flock can flourish. That should be the relationship with our government and the pastors. And right now it is dysfunctional at best. I, I think you spoke on something very important because remember from the Bible, when David tried to count his population, it's actually a great sin against God because right. only God can count populations and in their kingdom. Right. And uh, for the pastors to care about their numbers to so they compromise a lot of, on a lot of things is a really, really bad sign for the church. Right. There was like a Christian gathering and then there was like a, a few uh, youth pastor and they're like, oh, they, they thought I was a pastor too. And then they're like, oh, I'm like, I'm, I'm not a pastor. Felicia's like, oh, I'm not a pastor either. And they're like, then why do you guys do it? Why do you guys do this? Why do you guys go on YouTube and talk about biblical value? And I'm like, isn't that what every Christian should right. do? Right. Should, and and they, they are surprised. A lot of them, they are from uh, theologic uh, schools mm -hmm. and they don't understand why we're doing this. So I think a church has a lot of problem. They treat uh, spreading the faith and spreading the a biblical value like a job, mm -hmm. and they, that's why they care about numbers, and that's why they they they, get, they compromise on a lot of biblical value and teaching. Well, and that's the thing. I'm I'm not here to slam the pastors. I, I'm here to encourage them. Yes, because we're also told that righteousness exalts a nation, mm -hmm. and when you're holding your flock up as a righteous flock because you've been nurturing and caring for them and teaching them this is sinful behavior this is this is what we need to do or or you know we have a healthy flock then god says that nation will prosper and so i'm here to prosper the country that's why i'm running for congress cuz these values are found inherently in our documents our declaration of independence and the Constitution is based on that. And we recognize a creator. That's God. And we say that these rights come from God, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are all from our creator. Mm -hmm. All men are created equal. But listen, no creator, no rights. Mm -hmm. We're not equal. And we don't have rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness without a creator. Mm -hmm. So that's where we get the, the idea that we are Christian fundamentally based on Christian values, Judeo-Christian. And we shouldn't be ashamed of this. This is how we've been allowed to prosper, by God. So we recognize this. But the same God who gives us rights also says there are rules you have to follow. And with your family, and with your spouse, and with your community. You know, I support the biblical definition of marriage, and I support nurturing our children and not sexualizing them in school and teaching them sinful behavior, you know, at an early, early age. We we recognize the difference in boys and girls. You don't want boys and girls sports. Hmm. You know, you don't want men in women's locker rooms. You, we want to have a healthy society. And those are the rules of the creator as well. So we have to reinforce this. And this is also the fault of the Republican Party, because this party is supposed to stand for those rules. It's, it's a conservative, traditional values party, and they're not doing that. And so when the church falls, then the political, which should be the political arm of the church, which is the Republican Party, supporting all of these Judeo-Christian values, then it all falls apart. And we have right now what the United States looks like, lawless, anti-God, pro-communist. And now outside the, the conventions, they're screaming, we want to be communists. We want to be communists. They have no idea what they're actually asking for. And I, God forbid he allows them to, to take over this country and we become communists because communism is slavery. Mm -hmm. Anyone from China knows this. The government, when it controls every aspect of you, what you wear, what, where you're allowed to go, when you're allowed to go there, you're now a slave to the government. Mm -hmm. And that's true. And so we as a people are free here in the United States. That's why people come from all over the world to this country to be free. But we also have the responsibility here. And listen, 
if you get these people, they go, oh, I, I'm done with the process. If my vote won't count, you know, what's the point? There is a point because first of all, the only vote that doesn't count is the one that's not cast. Mm -hmm. You have to cast a vote. Why? Especially if you're a Christian. Why? So there's a parable in the Bible where the master goes on a, a vacation or he travels and he's got three servants. And one of the servants, he gives five pieces of money to, they call it talent. And then another one, he gives three. And then another one, he gives one. And then they take those talents and they invest them. The master comes back and he sees the five and he's doubled his money. Great job. And then the third one, great job. He doubled his money as well. But the servant who had one talent dug a hole and put it in the hole in the ground and did nothing with it. And that was the servant that the master judged and chastised because he said, I gave you something and you did nothing with it. If you're in the United States right now, you have an obligation to vote and vote for biblical values. Mm -hmm. You need to put people in office because you're here and God has given you this opportunity. And if you do nothing with it, you will be held responsible by God himself because he invested this one talent in you. And what did he do when he, he, he judged that one servant? He took it away from them and gave it to the others. Mm -hmm. This is crucial that the church understand this. We have been given a responsibility, an opportunity to invest in this country and support leaders who are going to support the foundations of this nation. And if you don't talk, take an opportunity here to do this, I'm sorry, you will suffer and the rest of us will suffer along with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it reminds me of the book of Esther. God put her there for a reason, for Esther to be in that position, to, to be the queen for a reason. And Mordecai was like, hey, God put you there for a reason. If you don't, if you don't fulfill your calling, God is going to do it with someone else and your family will suffer. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I love the story of Esther too. <laughs> it, it, mainly because it's one of the only books God isn't mentioned. Yeah. And but he's seen everywhere. And and people always go, Esther, oh, wonderful story. You know, you were created for just such a time as this. But to me, the the most amazing part is when the story turns, and it turns on this one moment where it says the king couldn't sleep that night mm -hmm. and he had someone read him you know, stuff that from, from their, their diary, basically, you know, what happened on this day? And he goes, Oh, what did we ever do for that guy? He saved my life. <laughs> and the whole story changed and it changed on a moment when the King couldn't sleep. That's the hand of God so clearly. And I love that because it gives me hope that even the little mundane things you might think are inconsequential, but they're actually earth changing. And uh, and we need to be aware of God's sovereignty at all times. Yeah, um, our government, uh, federal right. government, obviously have a lot of bad thing go going on. Uh, our southern border, our economic, uh, the world is in turmoil. They, the World War Three is like right in front of our doorstep. Russia, China, North Korea. Uh, Middle what do you East. think? Yeah, at Middle East, of yeah. course. What do you think is the most urgent? problem that we as American and when you go into Congress that you want to solve? Well, first of all, it, the big three, the, the border, the kids and the economy. Mm -hmm. And they're all you can't say one's more important than the other because they're all equally important. And we can do all three at once. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like we, we can only focus on one thing at a time, but we have to secure our southern border. It's not refugees that are coming in any longer. These are people here from other nations all around the world, military age, young men, and they're coming for a specific reason. It's not to make the United States better and stronger. Uh, so we need to we need to secure the border, figure out who's in this country right now and mitigate whatever they're trying to do. At the same time, we have an economy that is imploding. Mm -hmm. Under the, you know, when you, the first thing Joe Biden does is shut off the Keystone Pipeline and, and is trying everything he can to undermine 
our independence on energy, you know, our energy independence, because we're an economy that functions on crude oil. Yes. I can't get any of these, you know, intelligent eggheads to tell me <laughs> when the earth stopped creating crude oil. We may be in the biggest time of production of crude oil in the earth's history. Mm -hmm. They call it a fossil fuel, and that's a political term, mm -hmm. but it actually is bubbling up. It's the most natural resource we have. And, but the thing is, is our economy is not just based on maybe 10, 12% of that crude oil is used for gas and diesel. The others used for plastics and rubber and synthetics and fertilizer. And if we get rid of crude oil, which is what the left is pushing, we're back in the 1800s. Yeah. We're in, you know, horse and buggy, leather straps, no, no plastic, no rubber, none of that. It all goes away. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to destroy the world we live in. And they're creating a society of slaves. And they themselves see themselves as the new masters in this slave environment they're trying to create. And it's not just the United States. This is a global push right now. And they're doing it, they're destroying. What they're doing with people in this whole transgender movement mm -hmm. is an assault, a direct assault on the image of God because we're created in God's image. Mm -hmm. So they wanna destroy that. They wanna take and flip it around. Boys or girls, girls or boys, men can be this, men can have babies. What? <laughs> what? Because we're told in the Bible clearly, we're made in God's image and we multiply after our kind. Yeah. So this is a, a satanic attack against the very image of God and the kingdom of God. And it's so funny, isn't it? How they're all so willing to embrace Lucifer and Satan, but they say God doesn't exist. Well, how do you have one without the other, right? Yes. You're all satanic worshipers. But you refuse to acknowledge the other side. And that's the big lie. Because our side is the one that is actually winning. And they're fighting. But Lucifer is the great liar. And, and he's deceived so many people right now. And, and if you can see this world in a spiritual sense, uh, you know this is very exciting times. Yes. Because we've never seen anything like this. And I can point there in Revelation how close we are because there's a, there's a scene where this beast comes out of the water, mm -hmm. right? And he puts his foot on the sand and he's got one foot in the water. And we're told that the sand is the multitudes, but then the people, and, and then you get the, the, the antichrist has got an injury to the head and the false prophet heals him. But it says the people praise the dragon, mm. not the beast, they praise the dragon, and the dragon is told clearly to be Satan. Yeah. So you must have a satanic system of worship in place for this to occur, because otherwise they would they would worship the prophet who heals him or the the the, the beast himself. But no, they praise the dragon. Yes. That's how close we are. Yeah, I I, I think what you you point out is a uh, very important. Uh, our education system and our the, the way we teach our kids and uh, the they are not knowledgeable. They, they don't have any biblical knowledge, and what they get in from school is completely wrong. And you you talk about saving kids. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your plan on saving kids? Because right now, if you go to uh, a college congregation or a high school congregation, even inside a church, a very conservative church. A lot of them, they, they have their rainbow flag. And then a lot of the youth pastor, they actually go like, I, I remember this one youth pastor who just got on a meeting and go like, hey, what's, you, you know what's important right now? It's social justice. And uh, the church have to embrace social justice. I, 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 when I heard that, I, 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 re, I, I was really scared. Mm -hmm. for that church you should be i'm like wow you have no idea what right. you're talking about and you're leading a youth congregation they are the one that's go on, going to be a part of the, the your, your church in the future and that's what you guys are teaching them how, how do we deal with that 
Well, I mean, that scenario right there reminds me, you know, the, the Bible says, let not money, many among you become teachers, for they will incur the harsher judgment. Mm -hmm. And I think the hottest flames in hell are reserved for false teachers, mm -hmm. bad pastors, yeah, uh, who are using the word of God for other means. And, and these are apostate people. And I don't think there's any hope for them. I don't think there's any hope for a person who knows the Bible so well that they can twist it and use it for themselves. Because at that point in time, what do you tell them? They know the whole truth. They've seen it. They know it to the point that they can manipulate it for their own means. I think those people are lost. Mm -hmm. I really do. But as far as the kids, you know, again, we got to go back to why, why does the world look like it does? And it's squarely on the shoulder of pastors. A pastor who refuses to condemn homosexuality doesn't need to be in that church. He's not a Christian mm -hmm. because a Christian knows what the Bible says about homosexuality. It also knows what the Bible says about adultery. It knows what it says about theft and lying. And, you know, uh, all of these are things are sins. Yes. So last year when, when they had Pride Month, I put up a post and it said Shame Month because homosexuality is a sin. We shouldn't celebrate it. And then I said, well, what sin are we going to celebrate next month? Murder? Are we going to celebrate, you know, stealing? What's the next month? If we're going to celebrate sins... And this is the church. The church has to stand up and say, no, the Bible's very clear. And I'm telling you this because I love you. Mm -hmm. Because if you continue in this lifestyle, you will die and you will go to hell and you will burn eternally in a lake of fire. I don't want you to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling you the truth. That is a sinful lifestyle. But you, you're still alive and you can repent. You can get saved out of that. And I'm, because I care for you, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. And then you deal with it. Then it's up to God because our job is to throw the seed, mm -hmm. right? And then there's four kinds of soil in the parable, but God causes the growth. We're not responsible for the growth. Our job is to throw the seed. And the seed is the good news, the gospel truth. That's our job. But we have to be able to, just like John, lost his head. Remember, mm -hmm. John the Baptist lost his head because he said, you're not supposed to be sleeping with your brother's wife. <laughs> and they threw him in jail and then he was beheaded. So our job is to call out sin. We see that very clearly. We're supposed to say that's wrong, you know, and this is an alternative. But when the church is busy counting sheep, they're going to do everything they can to try and look like the world. Mm -hmm. Because they want their numbers to increase. Yes. Right? So they don't want to stand for something. They want us to fall for anything. Yeah. And that's wrong. That's the that's the whole part. The whole problem with this country right now rests on the shoulders of the church because we're the one institution God created to stand against the gates of hell. That's 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 good. That's very powerful. Uh, and and I, I also think that by counting numbers. By church want a bigger number, a bigger congregation. They actually put their fear. They they actually have fear of the world, not for the Lord. And I think that's they they're coward to the to their congregation, and they're promoting the idea of coward and uh, passive the pacifism. So, no, you're you're exactly right. Yeah, because killing babies. Is mm -hmm. not a political issue. Yes, thank you. It's not a political issue. This is a biblical issue. It's infanticide. It's murder. Mm -hmm. And my opponent voted for if the baby's born and you don't want it, leave it on the table. If it survives an abortion, withhold medical treatment and just let it die. That's infanticide. It's not abortion because the baby's already been born. Yes. And it survived. So this is the kind of evil we're talking about. People who are, they don't care about you. They don't care about children. They care about power mm -hmm. and the power they can exert on your life. Homosexuality is not a political issue. It's a biblical issue. So is marriage. Yeah, That is a biblical institution put in place by God himself to establish the union of a man and a woman and their image, which he said 
Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And it's his image that fills the earth. That's what's under assault today. His very image. Yeah. Um, I remember last time when you were here, talk about the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. And the first one who got thrown in to the lake of fire was the coward. And I believe that is the Christian who didn't stood up for righteousness and who just compromise with the world. I, I was speaking at a, at a church and I talked about abortion uh, and I talked about uh, gay marriage and I also talk about Israel and Hamas. Like mm -hmm. one, one is terrorist and one is Israel. <laughs> right. And I, we actually got an email and it says like, hey, can you stop talking about political uh, we, we don't want to be political church. It divides people. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the biggest problem with the church right now is that they see all these inconveniences as a political issue. So they actually give it up to Satan. They don't want to handle this thing. They just want their church to be peaceful, sheep, no fighting, a compromise on everything. And so their numbers can grow. I think that is... a extremely cowardly act mm -hmm. what 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 can regular congregation uh attendees do to tell their pastor tell their leader that they, they need to change well i mean first and foremost if you're not praying for your pastor it's it's on you already mm -hmm. as a, as the congregation are you lifting up your leader in prayer because what you need is God to reach down and touch his heart and, and show him that, that I've got this. I just need you to be a good shepherd of the sheep I've entrusted you with. And so then a, a pastor that has a biblical church mm -hmm. will have a board of elders mm -hmm. because you don't want to be the only person leading this. Yes. You want to be able to lean. And this is Timothy and Titus very clearly the godly standard for these people. And then we would have a conversation because the church right now needs to stand up for biblical issues. And we need to defend what are clear biblical issues and separate them from political issues. We don't need to get into this stuff, but we absolutely must address these issues. That's where that would be a start. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming in. We, we really need someone like Mike Cargill to go into our Congress and be our voice. Because this this world, this world, not just the United States, the whole world need biblical value, need God, need Bible in our lives. So uh, before he can go to Congress and be our voice, you must be his voice. You must speak for him. Tell your neighbors, tell your friends and family. If you live in that area, go walk the walk and talk the talk. Be his voice so he can be yours in Congress. Uh, can you tell uh, our audience again which district you're running for and then which uh, which city you represent? Yes, um, it's Mike Cargyle. And our website, please go to our website and check out everything is cargyle4congress.com. That's C-A-R-G-I-L-E-F-O-R, cargyle4congress.com. It's got nine cities from Pomona to Upland and Rancho, Ontario, uh, Fontana, Montclair, uh, Chino, Chino Hills, and Eastvale. And these are the cities that, that I will directly represent, but I actually will represent the entire United States with the issues we will deal with in the House of Representatives. God bless you. All right, thank you for watching and thank you, Mike, for coming. We'll see you guys next time.